um, we are on time. So um, welcome everyone once once again to the Ospology session. This uh, today's session is about academic OSPOS. That's going to be the topic and fostering open source culture at universities. And um, as any other Ospology sessions, the, we will first uh, save some minutes to uh, give a short presentation uh, with Stephen and, and Gerald. And we will then move to um, a more uh, broader discussions. And But before moving to, to this topic, I would like to um, give you some updates about uh, things that has been happening in OSPOS and to the group. So, um, First of all, uh, just heads up on some of the OSPO discussions that has been happening lately in the in the to do OSPO forum. So things that, that we are, have had conversations such as such as inner source programs fall within OSPOs or ways to manage the quality of contributions done by employees for an organizations to open source communities or also questions about how do you measure, how does organizations measure um, open source framework adoptions and how organizations manage uh, software bill of materials for open source projects. So uh, we have had a lot of different opinions, testimonials and, and questions there. So if you're interested, just go and check out everything is public. And, and you can also share your, your remarks as well. Uh, what's next? Yeah, we have new Tudor members uh, this uh, last week and also some OSPO tooling in the um, OSPO landscape. That is basically a landscape that tries to give an overview of all the organizations that are implemented OSPO also uh, tooling or OSPO related tooling that can help OSPO to um, advance in their OSPO way. And um, we have launched last month uh, the next OSPO news that is in to do newsletter. And that, as I always said, we uh, invite people to go to the repo because it's a public repo and contribute for the next one. We launch it every end of the month. So the next one will be in two weeks or one week so far. And basically everything related about OSPO can perfectly fit there. Like there, are, we've seen people contributing regarding upcoming call for papers or upcoming conferences, articles, OSPO related studies and so on that is uh, interesting for the overall OSPO community. And we also have a new to-do community mailing list where um, I know there's people that cannot access Slack channels or uh, maybe they have a lot of things to do and cannot uh, know about what's the, the upcoming calls and meetings we have. So we have released a community mailing list. So just to keep you up to date and, and be uh, on the loop here. And just last but not least, um, one of the latest programs we are building at the Tudor Group is the OSPO Associate Program. Um, I'm not going to get more into detail. Yes, you have these slides and you can go and check the documentation and, and the main reason of this. Um, but I'm just going to leave you here. Yes, it's, it's basically to try to find ways of collaborations now that OSPO is getting more and more uh, important. Um, and I've seen, we've seen organizations building or investing in OSPO in different sectors. So try to, to build a community here and try to bring different initiatives and communities that also have something to share for OSPOs and um, keep building this OSPO movement together. And, and that's that's one of the main reasons why we are creating this initiative. If you would like to learn more about that, um, just um, tomorrow in the Inner Source Commons um, conference, I'll be talking about more in detail about this idea of the OSPO accelerators, OSPO associates, just for you to, to be aware of. And 
I'm going to stop here. Um, well, also, uh, just some reminders about that these astrology sessions is not something private. People can contribute, people can offer to become a speaker and uh, share their remarks, take part in the voting process for upcoming topics and so on. And all you have to go to do is go to the repo and start contributing to it. So um, let's move now to the Oscar of the Month that is uh, um, Open Outreach uh, with Stephen Jacobs and the community expert this time is um, Chaos um, with Gero Link presenting. So um, Gero, I'm just gonna leave it to you and, and you can start um, explaining and introducing more about this topic. Just let me know when do you want me to start uh, passing on the slides and I will do so, okay? Yes, thank you, Anna. If you want to go to the next slide, that would be great. Thank you for having me. My name is Georg Link. I'm a co-founder of the Chaos Project and happy to partner with the to-do group in introducing our speaker today, Stephen Jacobs. Outside of Chaos, I'm the director of sales at Biturgia. I teach about open source communities at Brandeis University in the open source technology management program. And I'm the lead of the IEEE as a open community advisory group. Yes, I have many hats, but today I'm wearing the hat of Chaos. And Chaos is another Linux Foundation project that focuses on understanding the health of open source projects through metrics. The acronym CHAOS stands for Community Health Analytics Open Source Software. And we define metrics that can be used to understand community health. We publish software for collecting data and generating metrics about open source communities. And we establish best practices around all of this. We are a global community with backgrounds in industry, open source, and academia. And I invite you all to check out the Chaos project and community if you have an interest in the health of open source communities and metrics. And now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our speaker, Stephen Jacobs, who is a member of the Chaos project. And we will see today how his team is making the conversations that we have in Chaos um, and taking that to inform the work in his academic OSPO. Stephen Jacobs is a professor at the Rochester Institute of Technology in the School of Interactive Games and Media and the Golizano College of Computing and Information Sciences. For more than 10 years, Stephen has worked with students in free and open source software. They partnered with many open source projects and organizations with humanitarian mission. And Stephen is at the forefront of promoting an open culture, both in open source and education. And with the support of many others, he has taken the work to the next level by forming an open programs office called Open at RIT. I met Stephen through the OSPO++ network and the Chaos Project. And Stephen is following the ethos of releasing early and releasing often. And so it's really exciting to see how he is building this open programs office. We'll hear more about this and how he's building on top of the Chaos Grimoire Lab technology. And so with that, I'm turning it over to you, Stephen. And yeah, great to hear what you're working on today. Thank you, Georg and Anna, for the invite to come talk. And let's hop on. So the whole idea of an academic OSPO, at least in the US, is still new. Um, John Hopkins University first soft launched their OSPO, or just started talking about spinning one up in uh, 2019. Uh, we at RIT followed soon after. Um, I think Carlos and Stephanie in uh, attendance today are kind of looking to move that forward at their university and there's a group of other folks who are looking to do that with your universities as well. Um, open at RIT is 
an open programs office, to use a more inclusive term, because at, at my university and many others, um, faculty, staff, and students are working on FOSS, they're working on open hardware, open data, open health analytics, open educational resources, open access journals, open entrepreneurship, open design, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it, within my university, open at RIT is an open programs office that's interested in open work. The open science world likes to use open scholarship as an inclusive term, but then they always say open science or open scholarship and oh, by the way, we mean you guys in arts and humanities and that other stuff too, right? So we, we go with open work. We just want to be open to everybody all the time. Um, and academic OSPOs in general, of course, look at things like compliance and licensing and, and all that type of stuff and encourage participation. But they also have other responsibilities to support research and scholarship. Um, Johns Hopkins is focused, at least in part, on using their OSPO to kind of bolster civic and community outreach, both within the city of Baltimore and the city of Paris, where Lutess is, is built. Um, so as, as more and more academic OSPOs surface, uh, they're going to be more and more different. And we can go to the next slide, please, Anna. So as I kind of listed above, these are the kind of different things that an OSPO within a university might be trying to help and support. And we can pop to the next one, Anna. So Open at RIT emerged out of the work that I did primarily with undergraduates. Um, at this point, we have a kind of day one to graduation opportunity for our students to get involved in learning about um, open IP in general. That's important because at RIT, unlike a lot of universities, students own their own IP. Unless um, they're being paid by the university to work on a project or they've got a you know, part-time job or they're somebody's graduate assistant who's working on a grant, Anything else they own. Students in my game labs can use all our facilities, our network, our hardware, our software, build a game, spin up the company, go and make millions, and send us a thank you box of chocolates. That's, that's the only requirement that they have if they want to do that on their own. At least for me, I require a box of chocolates. So it's, it's, we have essentially, at my university, three different constituencies. Staff, who generally follow the model of most employees within most corporations. Faculty, who are in a gray area because they're kind of required to make their work open, but the university and they also want to be able to monetize or patent their work from time to time. So there's kind of a mix of licensing issues there. And then again, the students who can do what they want within a certain range of limitations I've already mentioned. So we created a a minor in open source in 2014. Minors are five courses and they actually get added to the diploma. So you can have majored in whatever you majored in and minor in free and open source software and free culture at RIT. Uh, the road to that, we've created a lecture for incoming freshmen to get used in freshman seminar. That's opt-in for all of our units on campus. So they do or they don't, but some of them use it. Uh, we have several classes that stand alone in FOSS history, contribution, and culture. And those standalone courses are lead-ins to the three-course immersion, which is a kind of outside of your major concentration at RIT. All students are required to take one, and minors, which are optional. We've run hackathons for years. We've won something called uh, LibreCore, which offers co-ops to students in partnership with FOSS work in humanitarian NGOs and 501c3s, and there's a lot more on that in the Linux Foundation blog post we wrote with LF called Open at RIT, Birth of an Academic OSPO. We get links to articles and all of that, 13 years of history. Next, please, Anna. So 
the things we've managed to accomplish in our first year is our website provides the university a lot of guidance due to that early and often remark. It's in its either third or fourth revision within one year because we keep adding stuff. But in general, it has information about best practices uh, for open work in terms of how to prepare your repo or your distribution or whatever it is, right? But you're out in your license and all that, those things, all those files. Um, we provide a guide in how to use that work about a page and narrative on the fact that faculty, staff, and students for their promotion or their evaluation or their tenure are going to want to talk about what they've done. Uh, universities tend to rely, especially for faculty evaluation and promotion, on, on a couple of metrics that most people don't like. Something called the H index, which tracks how many people have cited your peer-reviewed work. Um, but a lot of us don't work in peer-reviewed spaces, and it's very difficult at this point in time for faculty to work with their higher ups and their promotion, their evaluation committees to talk about why their open work has impact and value and that work is translatable to other places. So that guide has text and resources to articles that will hopefully help them make their case. Um, we have a library of resources in Zotero that talks about the history of open and the philosophy behind it, pros and cons, how to contribute to a project, things like that. And we have a playbook that's being drafted on designing for open community. A lot of the work that the Libre core team that I have that works with internal faculty fellows to help prepare their work for a larger community, a lot of that work is around UI, UX, uh, user-centered design, that type of work to help them figure out the different paths in which they want to attract the different types of contributors they're looking for. Next slide, please, Anna. Those faculty fellowships, um, we received a grant from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation last year in October for two years to help fund the startup of the OSPO and primarily support these RIT faculty fellowships. So we put out an RFP, faculty apply, and if they have proposed something we can support and meets our guidelines, they get the support of a team to do that work, to sit down with them, go through the user-centered design process, figure out the different ways in which they want to communicate to and build a community from, help them refactor or build new or first websites for them, get their repos up, make sure that they're pipeline is open friendly to whatever work and whatever data they're distributing. Those projects have spanned a pretty wide set of expertise, as you can see. Uh, the ones that are links, you'll be able to connect to opensource.com articles about those particular projects. Um, next slide, please, Anna. We've been making community contributions to IEEE SA Open, which is a fully open platform for software and community development. Um, Georg is part of that group as well. Solona, who runs that, is here, I see. And we work with the chaos community, and particularly on something called Mystic within our IT. And you can go to the next slide, Anna. So Mystic is a, is a Libre core project that is a plug-in and or sits on top of chaos to make it much easier for faculty to use. A faculty member who wants to register a project gets an account and is able to just drop a couple of URLs into that box. Might be a little hard to read, sorry about that. Um, Anna, next slide please. And with that, they can generate a wide range of reports. Um, we're trying to extend the sources that Chaos pulls in by taking not only the GitHub, GitHub and GitLab, when you say them together, that means they're GitHub, that's why I said that. And, um, but also to start pulling in from other sources of information that our faculty work with. A lot of our faculty 
and a lot of everybody's faculty work with a platform called the Center for Open Sciences OSF, which is a place where they post preprints of their research. Sometimes they put their data there. Sometimes they register research plans. And so we're starting to pull in the kind of same metrics that you pull in from GitLab or GitHub in terms of how active is that space. We want to use the community health analytics and contribute new ones to chaos that will help us give our faculty and everybody's faculty more of an opportunity to be able to communicate about the impact of their work that doesn't follow the standard peer-reviewed journal, peer-reviewed conference type of pipeline to get attention. Next slide, please, Anna. And so somebody who had multiple projects would see a collection like this, or if they wanted to push their collection out to the public in terms of the project that they're working on or the projects they're working on, there's this portfolio type of display to be able to show the work and the projects they're doing on, hopefully not only defend and make the case for their work, but be able to attract more people to their work. And I think the next slide is nothing. I think it's discussion time. So take it away, Anna. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna first stop recording.